No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. Good morning, Connection. Come on, stand to your feet and worship with us today. Let's celebrate the king. I wish I could tell you, wish I could describe him. But I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture Not enough words to ever say what I found Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy He is merciful and powerful Who are we talking about? That's my King Come on, say We declare the glory I'm letting the rocks cry without joining the chorus. There aren't enough notes to make the harmony. It's the song of the angels through all of the ages. It's all of the earth and heaven symphony. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy. He is merciful and powerful. Talking about that's my king. Come on, we the glory. Come on, give him all the honor. He's all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. If there's no one before you, yes, we will adore you. And all of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. my king that's my god that's my shepherd my protector that's my king that's my rock that's my anchor my chief Thank 
Come on and lift up a praise to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, for what He's done in your life, for things that you've seen Him and witnessed Him doing, for things that you didn't even know He did that He protected you from. Aren't you so glad that we serve a big God today? Amen. You can be seated. While you're being seated, you know, many times we come to church and we don't even know the people around us. We sit in the same seats. And I'm just going to ask you to do something, I don't know, hopefully it won't make you feel too awkward or uncomfortable. But I just want you to, to find the person around you that you don't know and say, hi, my name is. And, and put your name in there. Insert your name. <laughs> hi, my name is. <laughs> you know what? It's great when you know the people around you. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends. It just means you know the people around you. So it's an awesome thing. My name is Dusty, if we haven't met, and I just want to thank you guys for coming today and being part of our service here at Connection Church. Uh, it's so good to see each and every one of you. If this is your first day attending with us and being here, I would love to meet you after service at the guest services desk out in the atrium. And if you wouldn't mind it sometime today during the service, if you would just pick up that blue Connect card, it's in the seat back in front of you, fill that out with just as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. And at the end of service today, just take that card out to the desk in the atrium. We've got some team members there. I'd love to shake your hand and meet you too and, uh, and just be able to put a name with a face. And our whole goal here is to help every person on their journey with Jesus to grow into a deeper relationship with Him and in connection with the people around you because we're better together always. We're never good alone, but we're always better together. Uh, we're going to be giving uh, today and just giving uh, to the Lord uh, through our offering, through our tithe. Our sexual leaders are going to be coming in just a moment. They're going to pass some buckets around. But I want to read some scripture to you and just offer you just some, just some information that Jesus also gave the disciples. Because the information that he gave was good information. He told great stories. He told great parables. And I want to share that with you today also. But this is in Mark 12, it's verse 41, starting there. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Much like if we pass the buckets today, he, Jesus was sitting down and watching that happen. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And you might have heard the widow's mite before. This is talking about the widow's mite and the, the coins that she had. Then in verse 43, it says, Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. And when you think about that scripture, it's, it's a powerful scripture. It's a powerful time that Jesus was teaching his disciples. He called them over for an important meeting. He wanted them to notice what had just happened right there in that moment where they were given their offerings at the temple. And he wanted them to know that, you know, there was a lot of rich people there. and They were given out of their surplus. They were just given what they had left over. But this woman loved the mission that Jesus was on so much that she gave everything she had. Jesus was there in that time, and he was changing lives drastically. He was healing people. He was setting people free. People were being delivered. Their lives were changed in such a good way that this little lady, this little woman said, you know what? This is all I have. This is everything I have, but I love your mission so much, Jesus, that I'm willing to put everything that I have into the offering to make sure that the mission continues. And I think that's powerful when we think about our modern day reality right here. How, willing are, how much are we willing to put in to make sure the mission of Jesus continues? We're willing to put in the mission of Starbucks. We're willing to put in the mission of Timu or Sheen or whatever shopping uh, source that we like to shop from. But are we willing to put in to the mission of Jesus? And this little lady was so determined that she said, I don't care. Everything I have is going to his mission. I want to be that person today. I want you to be that person today, if that's where the Lord's calling you. I want you to be that person that says, you know what? The mission of Jesus has to go on. The mission of Jesus has to go forward. More people have to hear about the gospel. More kids have to know what the gospel says. They have to be able to know what on their level. More people have to be connected to each other because if they aren't, they're going to fall. Are you committed to the, to the mission of Jesus today? If you are, I just want you to raise your hand. If you're committed to the mission of Jesus Amen. 
This morning, we're going to give. That's how we're going to contribute to the mission of Jesus today. We're going to give. Our section leaders are going to come forward. They're going to pass buckets around. They've got offering uh, envelopes in the seat backs in front of you if you choose to use it that way. If not, you can give digitally, and all those ways are on the screen behind me. But we're going to pray before we give today. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to give, the opportunity to be in co-mission with your kingdom mission, God. And that's just spread the good news to everyone, Lord. Father, we just thank you for the privilege and the honor that it is to worship you in this way. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
church now. Come on, if you're thankful for the blood of Jesus, give him some praise right now. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you have the bread and the cup, would you get it ready at this time? After Adam and Eve rebelled against God and sinned in the Garden of Eden. They thought sowing fig leaves as loincloths would be sufficient to hide themselves before a holy God, their Creator. Yet they hid. And God comes to them knowing that they had sinned, knowing that they had rebelled against Him, God comes to where they were and visits them and says, where are you? That was not a question of geography. That was a question of soul health. Where are you? You're not where I created you to be. You're not where you can be. You're not where you used to be. And Adam confesses. He says, here's what happened. Here's where I'm at. And God deals with their sin. God speaks to their sin. God speaks to Adam's. God speaks to Eve. God even speaks to the serpent. And then Scripture says that God slays an animal right there in the place of their sin and with its skin he makes coverings not just loincloths but covers them totally and completely so that's the thing about our sinfulness we think that it's just a small little thing no big deal and God says, actually, your sinfulness, it covers more of you than what you know. It's affected more of your life than what you realize. It's affected your entire identity. And God slays that animal, and with its blood, with life, their sin is covered. God tells Abraham to take his son, his only son, to Mount Moriah and be prepared to offer him to the Lord. And just as Abraham has his hand raised with the knife in it, the angel of the Lord stops Abraham and says, Stop. You've proven your faithfulness. And God has provided himself a ram caught in the thicket 
You fast forward. Moses is about to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. And on their last night, God tells Moses to keep make sure everybody is in the house. They don't leave. And to take the blood of a male spotless lamb and to apply that blood on the doorpost. And everybody stays on the inside of the house because on the other side of the blood of the lamb, when the death angel passes by, as long as you're on this side of the blood of the lamb, you'll be safe. That night would be called Passover. And we've went from an animal in the garden to a ram caught in the thicket to a perfect male spotless lamb. And for over a thousand years, the Israelites commemorated that night with Passover. And there would be all the different elements of what was called the Seder, the Passover meal. Jesus grew up having the Passover meal. Jesus would lead the Passover meal with the disciples. But on the last Passover meal, he sat there with them in the upper room as they had the bread and they had the four cups of wine and they had the roast lamb and they had the bitter herbs and they had everything there that they always had. But Jesus told them as they took the bread, and won't you right now hold the bread in your hands? Jesus told them, this bread is my body which has been broken for you. They've never heard that before. Jesus is letting them know every Passover for 1,500 years has just been a type and a shadow that's been leading up to this moment. The animal slain in the Garden of Eden Abraham's ram caught in the thicket, all of it has been pointing in this direction. The moment that you are in right now, it's all been leading up to right here. This bread is my body, which is broken for you. Let's take the bread. Thank you for your body, Lord bruised, pierced, rejected, striped, not for your own healing, not for your own peace, not for your own iniquities, but for ours. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Adam and Eve learned that day that sin always has a price. Sin always has a price. In the institution of the Jewish law, there were different offerings and sacrifices for different sins and different things that would be committed, trespass offerings and violations of the moral law, violations of the civil law ranging from small to great, turtle doves to bulls. Sin always has a price. But day after day, year after year, offerings continued to have to be given. There wasn't one that could ever completely take away sin. Until that day, Jesus sat at that table and he said, this cup, is the blood, my blood, of the new covenant. Those disciples in that room had no idea the implications of what Jesus was saying. John the Baptist did when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. 
because of Jesus. Sin is not merely covered. Sin is washed away. And His perfect sacrifice only to be given one time, not to be repeated, but one time. That sacrifice was sufficient for all. And Jesus looked at everyone at that table that day and He said, take and drink all of it. All of it. All of you. All of you. For everyone at that table, it was the same cup. For the doubter and the denier, it was the same cup. For John, who would stand at the foot of the cross, and for all those who would flee from the cross, it was the same cup. Wherever they would be, in whatever their past, it was the same cup. Listen, friend, whatever your story is, it's the same cup of the blood of Jesus Christ that is sufficient for you. However faithful you feel like you've been to the Lord, you still need the blood of Jesus Christ. However far from Him that you have run in your life, however angry you may be at God right now because things haven't gone the way that you wanted them to go, whatever your story is, it's the same cup for everybody. It was the same cup for Peter that denied Jesus that it was for John that stood faithful at the foot of the cross. It's the same cup for everybody. And I've got good news for you today. The cup is still full. The cup of Jesus, of His blood that saves and heals and delivers and makes clean and makes brand new. His cup is not run dry, but His cup is still full and is waiting for every single one of us today. Lord, we thank You for Your blood that makes us righteous. (coughs) We thank You for Your blood that because of it, we can be clean in the eyes of God. Not in our own good works, not in our own good standing, not in our last name, not in our education, not in anything we can do. But it's because of you we receive the cup today. Let's take the cup. Thank you, Jesus. We just lift our hands and worship the Lord here for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your healing. Thank you, Lord, for your cleansing. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God is so good. His presence is so real and refreshing. Thankful for it. If you have your Bible, I want you to look with me today. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Mark, chapter 11, and we'll begin reading at verse number one here in just a moment. I want to give you context in what we're about to read. Jesus is in what would be the last week of his life and public ministry. He has been traveling, preaching, teaching, and performing miracles in different communities, most recently in Jericho. And as we're picking up the reading, he is going from Jericho back up to Jerusalem. And as he's headed toward Jerusalem, the first little community that comes into sight at the top of the mountain there is Bethpage, but Jesus is headed into Bethany. Bethany is a little suburb, essentially, of Jerusalem, and still to this day uh, is really just on the outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. And Jesus is headed back to Bethany because he has friends that are there. The friend is a man named Lazarus. Anybody remember Lazarus? Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, knew that Jesus would be coming back through And they've prepared a feast. This feast would not be a a small, intimate gathering, though. But hundreds of people have heard that Jesus is coming. And it's also the week of Passover. So because it's Passover, 
there are thousands of visitors. Jews from many different nations are packing into this area to be in town for the Passover feast. They also have heard that Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, lives close by, and they want to see the man raised from the dead, and they want to see the man who raised him from the dead. They are going to essentially be party crashers. They're they're trying to press in to this dinner party, and it spills out into the street. And as people from many different nations have crowded in to see Jesus, Jesus chooses this moment to make a statement about himself. And it would be the most dangerous statement that Jesus would make because, as I want to share with you, it was this statement that cost him his life. And this account in Mark's gospel provides more detail. Mark chapter 11 verse 1 says, as they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside the street. And they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them and they gave them permission. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leaf, leafy branches on which they had cut from the fields. And those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. This event what we call Palm Sunday or triumphal entry would be what drove the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, and eventually the localized leadership from the Roman Empire. It drove them over the edge and agree that Jesus must be eliminated, that Jesus must die. And the question is why? What is it about Jesus riding on a donkey, that uh, seemingly innocent moment, what is it about that that could possibly provoke such a violent response? What would be about this moment that would necessitate a murder conspiracy? Well, I want to share with you today that the seemingly innocent act of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey is in fact Jesus declaring himself King and Messiah. You and I may not see that here as we read the text, but for everybody that was there that day that understood the Word of God and were, was reared knowing prophecy in their custom, they knew exactly what was happening. They understood that Jesus is confessing himself king by fulfilling a prophecy stated in the Old Testament prophetic book, Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9, that says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. And that's not just a political king, but that very much means Messiah. Your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble, look at this, and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It had been understood for centuries now that when Messiah comes, when the true king, the son of David comes... He's not going to come typically presented as a warrior on a stallion. 
That's how you'd expect a king to come into the city at that time, would be mounted upon a stallion, coming in, uh, uh, a parade in a parade with the triumphant horse of battle, his victorious and faithful steed. And he's Shrek fans. Samir so like, maybe this is why Shrek had donkey. Maybe. But instead, they understood when Messiah comes, when the real king comes, it's not going to be on a white stallion. It's going to be on a donkey. Most of them, though, thought that was figurative. That's just typological. It's an analogy. It's not real. They, had, they, they were expecting that the real and rightful king of Israel, he's going to deliver us from Rome, going to deliver us from all of our enemies. Surely it's not going to be he's coming in here in some lame, broke-down donkey. Bah. And yet Jesus says, no, go get the colt and bring it here. Right in the middle of Passover season where it's packed with people traveling from all over the nation. Jesus doesn't enter Jerusalem during this festival season on foot, as the custom of a pilgrim is, but he enters on the colt of a donkey. And when he sees this, it would cause, it would bring to mind, when all of the people that are there familiar with the Messianic prophecies, bring to mind, this is Zechariah. They'd been whispering about Jesus. They'd been asking Jesus. They'd been talking about Jesus. Is he the Messiah? Jesus took the disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. Who do, who do people say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're a prophet Moses talked about. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock I'll build my church. But Jesus had never publicly affirmed this. And in this moment, the simple act of getting upon a donkey and riding into Jerusalem, Jesus was letting them know in this singular act, I am the long-awaited King and Messiah. Who you've been praying for? I am he. Who you thought that I might be, who you heard that I might be, who Simon Peter understands me to be, I'm letting all of the people here know that I am the one that the prophets prophesied about. He is here and the kingdom is now. Jesus was letting, make no mistake about it, that's who he is. But the power of Palm Sunday it's not just that Jesus is declaring his kingship, but the people that were there acknowledged his kingship. You see, they were involved in the moment. The people in the crowd, they acknowledge Jesus is our king. We've seen it, right? Here's Lazarus. We just broke bread with the man. He was dead four days. By now he stanketh. We know him. He's healed Lame people. He's given sight to blind people. He's walked on water. He's calmed storms. He's cast out demons. Jesus is not a king. He's my king. They're not just part of a crowd. They are acknowledging kingship. He's my king. They're doing that in a couple different ways. The Bible says that they take their coats or their cloaks, their outer garment, and they lay them on the street. The taking off of their outer garment, their, their coats or their cloaks, and laying on that mud-saturated dirt road, that was the equivalent of, of rolling out the red carpet. You so say, we, we, we don't really connect with that act today. Put, um, if you were going to walk down the road and I'd put my coat out in front of you for you to step on, we don't, we don't do that today. But it was an ancient custom, an ancient statement of honor. In fact, it's one of the ways that people could participate 
in the coronation or the enthronement of a new king. That if a, if a young man was ascending the throne and was being installed, that people could take part in, in the acknowledgement of the royalty of that new king by laying their coat out in front of him to walk in. It's, it's a way of identification. That's not just a king, that's my king. And we honor you. I honor you as my king. And as Jesus on that donkey is coming down from the Mount of Olives and is going through the, the, the path across the Kidron Valley, uh, Kidron Valley and into the gate into Jerusalem, I want you to get this in your mind of hundreds of people that are taking the literal coat off their back and laying it in front of Jesus. And here's what they're saying. I lay everything down before you. Because in the Jewish law and the Jewish custom, the coat and the cloak was a really big deal. It was such a big deal that if you went into debt or you were pawning something, it was written in the law that if someone gave you their coat as collateral on a debt, you couldn't keep it past sundown. You had to give it back to them so they would have some warmth at night. The coat and the cloak spoke of the most basic essential element in Jewish life. Many people slept on the floor, and that's what they used for a blanket. It's what they used for warmth at night. And when they take the coat off their back, and they're laying it in front of Jesus, they're saying, Jesus, I surrender everything to you. All of who I am and all that I have is available to you. It is yours. It, I submit it into the service of my king. I have nothing in reserve. Nothing is mine and mine alone, but it all belongs to you. I surrender everything to you. When I was in high school, I worked at J.C. Penney, my hometown in Indiana. And uh, I enjoyed it at first, and then I realized, oh, this means I have to be in the public. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it never failed if I had a customer and I was trying to work with them and find some. I worked in the suit department, so I'm dealing with suits and shirts and ties and different things. And, uh, there would always be the question of, do you have anything more in the back? In the back. Anybody ever ask, you got any more in the back? If you've not worked in retail, let me give you the psychology of the customer. This is you included. You realize that the back is a magical place. It doesn't matter how big the building is. In our mind as the customer, I do it too. In our mind as the customer, the back is this fairy tale land where there is multiple versions in your size always in various colors and shapes and anything that you could ever imagine. It's like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory back there only for clothes. And everything that your heart would desire is where? In the back. I'd been in the back. There's only lazy employees trying to hide from doing any work back there in the back. There's broken down forklifts. There's nothing. There, trust me, whatever's back there, you don't want. You'll make a trip to the health department after you come out of there. And I would say, I'm sorry, everything I have is on the floor. That's what they're saying on Palm Sunday. Jesus, I don't have anything in the back. Everything that I have is on the floor. It's before you. I lay it down. Here's what we need to stop and ask of ourselves on this Palm Sunday. Do I have anything in my life in the back? What am I holding back from surrendering to my king? What am I not willing to lay down before my king? What am I trying to hold on to and say, no, that's mine. I don't want to give it to my king. What part of my life am I still trying to preserve and declare, I am king over that? I, I want to be king over my time. I don't want the, the royalty and the majesty of Jesus infringing on my time. I want to be king over my time. No, no, no. I, I want to be king over this part of my life. I want to be king over that pet's 
sin. I don't want to give it to Jesus and lay it on the floor and say it's yours. Your feet can tread upon it and you can put it under subjection. I don't want to give that little pet sin to Jesus. I want to hold it and I be king of it and I want to keep it in reserve. It may be it's money. I don't want Jesus to be king of my money. I want to be king of my money. I want to call the shot. I don't want to lay it down before him. What is it that you're holding on to? Because the truth is we all got something. We all got something. Some of us, it's, it's a testimony. You got a testimony of where God's brought you from, what God's brought you through, but you don't want to share it because you're too ashamed, you're too embarrassed. You don't want people to know that that was you and you were really there and that really happened. You're holding it back. Whatever it is. Those people that day were saying, I'm going to lay it all for you. I don't have the red carpet to lay down. I don't have purple robes of majesty to lay down. I just got beggar's garments. But whatever I have, Jesus, I lay it down to, for it to be put under your feet. Everything that I have is under your feet. Paul, the apostle, said, I don't consider anything that I have uh, to be worth holding on to. But everything is like dung. I'll lay it down and put it under your feet. My titles, my education, my accolades, my accomplishments. There's nothing that I want to hold on to, but I consider it all dung that I may gain the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Whatever you got, friend, whatever, whoever you are, whatever is within your grasp, let's lay it down before him and say, Jesus, I put it under your feet. They surrendered it to him. Their coats and their cloaks The Bible says that those of them that didn't have a coat or a cloak, that they ran nearby to the tree that was most common in that area, which is the date palm. I've had dates in Israel, and tell you what, Lord have mercy. Date honey. That's the kind of honey the Bible is referring to when it says the land that flows with milk and honey was date honey. You ain't had honey. And you ain't had chicken till you have date honey chicken. You baptize that chicken in that date honey, it'll come up speaking in tongues. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. They went to the date palm and they pulled off. This was the closest we could get. I wish I could tell you every time I think of a visual aid that would assist you in internalizing the message. I think about it six to eight weeks in advance so we can really get the best time. But this was more like six to eight hours in advance. This is the best we could do in Pikeville, Kentucky, not known as the land of palms. (laughs) But those palms that they, palm leaves, that they pulled down were six to nine feet long. Taller than they were. Imagine the the sight that day of those people from all over the world holding up palm leaves larger than they are. You say, what's the big deal about the palm leaf? Well, in that time, in that culture... The palm leaf spoke of victory. Waving a palm leaf was used in celebration. It was even, it was so synonymous that it worked its way into ancient Rome and into their athletic competitions. It was a poem of victory that when anyone was victorious, they would wave a giant palm branch. And Jesus coming into the city gates, that's what they did when a king would conquer a land. He'd go to battle and he would come back home. That the citizens of that community would go out to the city gate to meet their conquering king. And as an act of celebration, they would all wave palm branches. 
and hail the conquering king who's come back home. That's what they're doing that day. That's what Palm Sunday is. It's not a group of children participating in, in, a, in a cute little activity. No, it is subjects recognizing the power and of their conquering king. And they are all sailing, all hail King Jesus. You have conquered. You have proven that you can conquer blindness. You've proven that you can conquer deafness. You've proven that you can conquer leprosy. You've proven that you can conquer the storms. You've proven that you can conquer sin. You've proven that you can conquer anything. And we are here to acknowledge Jesus. There's not a battle that we may face that you, our conquering king, won't win. And they wave. They wave to acknowledge the victories of their king. Get that image in your mind. People from all over that are participating, recognizing the victory of Jesus. But friend, not only is it a moment there, but what they couldn't possibly know was it's a picture of heaven. Because John the Revelator, as he is banished to the Isle of Patmos, and the Lord allows him to peer beyond the veil and to see in the heavenlies, John says this in Revelation chapter 7, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and all peoples and all tongues. That sounds like Palm Sunday right there. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and what did they have? Palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God. Friend, you know what that means? You and I weren't at the first Palm Sunday, but we're going to be at the last Palm Sunday. We weren't able to be there in the old Jerusalem and wave palms and as a sign of our king has conquered, but we're going to be in the new Jerusalem, and we're going to be there to celebrate the victory of our king with palm branches in our hands, saying he has conquered death, hell, and the grave, and we will celebrate his victory. Come on, let's do it right now. Give him some praise. Come on, give him some praise. You may not have a palm branch, but you can just wave your palm. Lord, we celebrate your victory. They had no idea that they were given a little bit of heaven on earth. That he is triumphant. He's triumphant over Israel. He's triumphant over every culture. He's triumphant over every nation. He's triumphant over every tribe. He is the same victorious king everywhere. They were acknowledging his kingship. They were celebrating his kingship. They're saying he's not just a king, that's my king. That's my king. Is there anybody that feels that way this morning? Jesus is not just a king, he's my king. David said it like this, the Lord is my shepherd. He's not a shepherd, he's my shepherd. Now, while they're laying their coats, their cloaks, waving palm branches, they're also shouting something. They're shouting the word Hosanna. Can we all say that this morning? Hosanna. One more time. Hosanna. If you're watching Church Online, maybe you're traveling for spring break, type that in the chat box. Which, by the way, apparently we got a lot of people in our church family that have spring break this week. God bless you. Get home for Easter. I'm not joking. What do they mean when they're saying Hosanna? Hosanna. That word Hosanna, it's Hebrew and Aramaic. It's an ancient word, and it means save us now. In the Hebrew, it's Hoshiana. Lord, save. Save us now. That's what they're shouting. That's what they're saying when Jesus is coming in on a donkey coats and cloaks laid on that muddy ground, palm branches that are waving, they're all shouting out together, save us now, save us now, Lord save, save us now. They are crying for deliverance, they're shouting for deliverance, they're recognizing if we're going to be saved, we can't save ourselves. 
If we're going to be delivered, we can't deliver ourselves. If we're going to be redeemed, we can't redeem ourselves. It's only going to come from the conquering king. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It comes from Psalm 118, verse 25. O oh Lord, do save. That's, that verse starts, Hosanna. We beseech you, O oh Lord. We beseech you. Do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They're crying out for the salvation of the Lord. I want to know, has anybody got somebody on your heart in this Easter season that you're, you want him to be the Hosanna of? Lord, save. Lord, save. I believe we can see that today. This is happening at a specific place coming into Jerusalem. There are many different gates and access points coming into Jerusalem from outside in a place like Bethany where there were, or if you were coming from the north, different gates and ways to come in. But Jesus is entering on the donkey at a specific gate coming into Jerusalem. It was the eastern gate. I took a picture of the eastern gate the last time I was in Israel. There it is, right in the center. It's been closed up. That gate has been closed and open, closed and open many different times, but that particular sealing of the gate goes back uh, about six to seven hundred years. Jesus is entering through that gate, the eastern gate. The eastern gate was also known at the time as the Shushan Gate, named after the southern capital of Persia where the Jews from the southern kingdom of Judah in Jerusalem had been in exile. You say, why is that? There was an image of that city, Shusha, on the gate. They fashioned an, a, a, an image, a replica of Shusha and put it on the front of that gate so that every time a Jewish citizen would walk by the eastern gate, they would see that image of Shusha and be reminded of where God brought them from. When they were rebuilding the temple after their exile, when they were rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the gates, rebuilding their homes, and they get to building the eastern gate, somebody says, we can't come into the presence of God, we can't come into the temple and forget where God brought us from. So we need a reminder. We need to be reminded and we need to make sure that our children and our children's children don't forget where God brought us from. That we don't get so arrogant that we make the mistake of our forefathers and think that we've done this all ourselves. That we think we've been so good and we've been so faithful and we've been so worthy. We need something to remind us that when we rejected God and we thought we didn't need His word and we thought that we could do it by ourselves, when we were carried off into captivity, when we cried to the Lord and we humbled ourselves and repented, He was merciful and He brought us back. So the eastern gate became known as the mercy gate. The mercy gate. What gate did Jesus choose to go through on his public coronation as king? The mercy gate. He's letting everybody know this is the king that I am. I'm a merciful king. This is what I want you to experience from me is the mercy of God. That's what he has his face pointed toward on Palm Sunday as he knows crucifixion is coming. As he knows betrayal is coming. He's walking through the gate of mercy. He is a merciful God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Paul says this, but God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I love that. Paul said, but being rich in mercy. He's not run out of mercy. But he is full and abundant in mercy. 
God being rich in mercy with his great love. Jesus, what gate are you going to go through? I'm going to go through the mercy gate. I want everybody to know that no matter how broken you may be, no matter how hard you've been running from God, no matter how far you've been running from God, no matter how angry you may have been, no matter how many times you've cussed the name of God, no matter how many times you've shaken your fist toward the heavens, I want you to know that the king goes through the mercy gate. 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because of his great mercy. Jesus said, that's the gate I'm going through. He goes in through the gate. It's a loud, raucous celebration. And the Pharisees that were there hated every minute of it. They said to him, Rabbi, get your disciples to quiet down. And Jesus said, if these people stop praising, the rocks are going to cry out. Palm Sunday tells us something important. I want you to hear me. Palm Sunday tells us you can't be neutral about Jesus. There were two groups that day. Those acknowledging the kingship of Jesus and those rejecting the kingship of Jesus. Those that were celebrating who Jesus is and those who hated who Jesus is. But no one was neutral. It's the same today. There is no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. We're either laying or all before him and saying, that's my king. Or we as we are, as the Bible calls, an enemy of God. Actively fighting against the kingship of Jesus and saying, no, I'm king. I'm king. You're not king. I'm king. But whichever crowd you belong to, there is no neutral. Jesus wants you to know that he's the king that went through the mercy gate. That he's choosing mercy and making mercy available for you. That's the truth of who he is. Not caricatures, not life experiences that may tell you this thing or that thing about Jesus. He chose that day to declare for himself this is who I am. I'm king. And I'm Savior. But all of us have to acknowledge and confess Him for ourselves. Can you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the reality of your kingship. Thank you for your spirit that's speaking to us today, dealing with us, striving with us. Some of us today have some things we need to lay down before you. We have a coat we need to take off. We got some stuff we need to surrender and say, here, I give it to you. It's yours. Nothing in the back, no reserves. Some of us today need to move from trying to be neutral, standing on the outside, riding the fence when it comes to the claims of Jesus and the kingship of Jesus. And today be the day, this be the moment that we say, no, he's my king. He's my king. Today, get off the throne, friend. Take the crown from off of your head. 
and acknowledge you are not Lord and you are not King, but He is. Give Him all of who you are. Past, present, and future. Good, bad, and ugly. Lay it down before Him. And let the King who went through the mercy gate pour out His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness, His love upon you. If you're here in this room right now and you say, I know I'm not right with God, but today I want to be. This is the moment I want to lay my life before Jesus because he laid his life down for me. Jesus, I give you my sin. Jesus, I give you my struggles. Jesus, I give you my habits. Jesus, I give you my future. Jesus, I give you my life. Today I want to walk out of here knowing that I am right with God. And I confess and turn of sin. And today I choose Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, friend, we're going to pray here in just a moment. But this is your chance. This is your moment right here. To boldly, to boldly step into another group and say, Yes, Jesus, you are not just a Lord, you are my Lord. You are not just a king, you are my king. If that's you right now, just very simply lift your hand toward heaven as a sign of surrender and acknowledgement. God bless you. God bless you right here. Somebody else. Today's the day. I'm not playing around with it. Today's the day I'm giving my life to Jesus. No more games. No more kind of, sort of. No more halfway a little bit. Today I'm going all in with God. Praise God. Back here. I see you, sir. Somebody else. I see a young man right up here. Praise God. Somebody else. This is your moment. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, can we all pray right now with three people giving their life to Christ? Lord Jesus, I say yes to you. Thank you for being my king. Thank you for being my Lord and my Savior. I confess you as my only hope of salvation. I receive today your grace. I'm a new creation right now by faith and through your grace. Everything is being made new. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and I'll live for you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God big praise. Praise God. Guys, uh, I'm going to invite our prayer team up. They're going to uh, come up here uh, and be available after service to pray with anyone who wants prayer for any need that you might have. Um, so if prayer team wants to go ahead and come, that would be fine. They're just going to be lined up here in the front. After service is dismissed, you can just make your way up to them. Um, I just want to invite, uh, remember to uh, remind you about Easter and use the invite cards that are in your seats there. Be sure you invite your friends, your family, those who are who are far from the Lord and just get them here in the house to hear the message of Jesus. We're so excited about that. And what better way uh, than to end our month than having Easter Sunday combined with Baptism Sunday. We're going to have baptisms uh, in our services next Saturday and Sunday. If you haven't taken that next step of baptism, I encourage you to do that. You can sign up at the guest services table today. We'll be glad to help you take that next step. But uh, 